you cannot. Prophecy in the Bible is set by God. It has a sacred agenda. And because God cannot change His eternal word, it will come to pass exactly as God has said it would be. So in the last days, again, we're still in the introduction, in the last days, satanic warfare in heaven and on earth, the worship of the Antichrist and the creating uh, of an idol in the great tribulation uh, is coming, and the death and the resurrection of the Antichrist. Uh, Those are three things that I want you to have in your notes that will be critical during the last half of the great tribulation. Again, we're not in the Great Tribulation. Uh, I could uh, take a lot of time in establishing through Scripture why I know that we're not in the Great Tribulation. Uh, There are many who will say that we are. There are many who believe that the Great Tribulation already took place. Uh, But biblically, it is not so. The Great Tribulation is ahead of us, and the church is going to be raptured before the Great Tribulation. Uh, With that said, let me give to you in the infancy of this teaching the seven names of Satan in the Bible. Uh, And if you have your Bible, go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9. The Bible speaks to us here and tells us, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. Let me just pause right here. I, I can't bypass this. Uh, in my lifetime, there has been an incredible increase of messianic ministry. Uh, I thank God for pure messianic ministry. But even those who are in the leadership of Messianic ministry would agree with me on this and probably uh, would be a lot more uh, dominant in their viewpoint. There is a lot of ridiculous, I'm trying to be gracious here, unprofitable individuals involved in Messianic ministry. And uh, some of these individuals go to great lengths trying to establish the fact Uh, that they're Jewish. And uh, I'm thinking of several people that I've met through the years. Their minds, uh, their names are running through my mind. I'm not even going to mention them. But let me just tell you, there are some ridiculous attempts of people in the body of Christ trying to establish uh, their Hebraic roots and Jewish culture. Hey, if you're Jewish, you're Jewish. Praise God. But if you're not Jewish... You're not Jewish. And no attempt to pervert that and make yourself to be something that you're not is going to change that. I just find it interesting uh, for some of you to see this, that this is a part of the book of Revelation in Bible prophecy. The Bible speaks of the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So there is the very first title for the devil in the book of Revelation, and his name there is Satan. Go down to verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Verse 9, Satan. Verse 10, the devil. Now, go over to Revelation chapter 12. I'm just taking time in the infancy of this teaching to show you the names of Satan and the devil in Scripture and where they're located. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Uh, Number three, 
The Bible addresses him as the fiery red dragon, or in uh, some Bibles it just is translated the great red dragon. Uh, go down to verse 9. Verse 9, the Bible said, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Here he is called the great dragon. Then in verse 9, uh, he's also called the serpent of old. And then in verse 10, the Bible says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. Here he is called the accuser of the brethren. And that word brethren in the original text would include both male and female. The devil is the accuser of the children of God. And then in Revelation 12 and 9, and also in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, he is called the one who deceives the world. I take time to cover that, as fundamental as it is, because one of the most common questions that I get in Bible prophecy is people are reading and studying the book of Revelation. Uh, they'll say, you know, who is the great dragon? Who is the accuser mentioned here? And so on. And so for those of you who are brand new to Bible prophecy, uh, this is important for you to understand. Uh, if you didn't get them, let me give them to you again. Number one, he's called Satan. Number two, he's called the devil. Number three, he's called a great red dragon. Number four, he's called the great dragon. Number five, he's called the serpent of old. Number six, he's called the accuser or the accuser of the brethren. And number seven, and lastly, the one who deceives the world. So with that in mind, let's get into the heart and the meat of today's subject. What are the seven end time works of Satan? Write that down. What are the seven end time works of Satan? I believe uh, Dr. Walvoord, the great prophecy teacher and scholar, has gone home to be with the Lord long ago. But I think he referred to these as the seven end time priorities uh, of Satan. And uh, they've been addressed in, uh, in many books and many prophecy teachings. Uh, they're really important and I want you to know them. Number one, if you're taking notes, and again, here's what I want you to have for a mindset as we're teaching on this. I want you to see the teaching today from Bible prophecy, from an end time chronology. I want you to see what we're teaching today within the greater context of why you're living in the world of chaos that you're living in now. Uh, for those of you who are watching this broadcast in America, I want you to see this teaching today within the context of why is America seemingly coming unglued? Why all of a sudden all of this emphasis upon things that Americans have never stood uh, for in the past, nor tolerated in the past? Why all of a sudden is socialism uh, becoming acceptable and becoming a political platform? In a country where we went to war, our soldiers shed their blood to keep socialism and democratic socialism and communism and Nazism. We fought world wars and shed blood to keep that out of our country. Why is what some would refer to as democratic socialism why is that now a major political platform, not in some far third world country, why is that now the topic of discussion in the forefront of many political discussions in our own country? Why do we have elected officials and presidential candidates and senators 
openly attacking Israel, the Jewish people, anti-Semitism, why all of a sudden has this become an acceptable viewpoint and an acceptable political uh, argument and platform, not only among people that are elected officials and governors and senators and so on, but in upcoming presidential candidates. Why? And uh, I could just go down the list of things that we're seeing in America that most of us who have a little gray hair uh, at this point in life, it, you can't help but scratch your head and wonder what in the world is going on in this country. I would argue with you that America right now is in a more volatile position than it was prior to the events that led up to the Civil War. And I chose my words carefully. I am telling you that I personally believe as a student of history that America is in a more chaotic, hateful place now, a more divided position now, than it was in the events that led up to the Civil War. Uh, the events of American history that caused the Civil War, uh, you could put most of those problems uh, in a handful of categories. Uh, not so today. The intensity of division is not one issue. It's multiple issues that have divided our country. Those of you who were using social media for the propagation of the gospel, but social media by and large is just an open venue of spew of hatred and divisiveness and argument and individuals and name calling and so on, I want you to see today the context of what I'm teaching out of the book of Revelation and end time prophecy and the seven final works of Satan. I want you to see how this is not a work. This is not something that is going to come in the great tribulation. It is already here. It is already active, it is already working, and the escalation of it is not going to go away. It is going to continue to escalate. The Bible says, listen carefully, that the rapture of the church and the removal of the bride of Christ from planet earth is going to take away, are you listening, the restrainer. The Bible calls that time and the church and the rapture, the removal of a restraining force. So you have to ask yourself the question, if we are already living with the chaos and the hatred and the division and our nation and the very fabric of America being torn apart before our very eyes, if we're already living with this dysfunction and this level of wickedness, imagine what it's going to be like when the restraining power of the church and the righteous are removed by means of rapture. Once the church is gone, then a literal hell on earth is going to come into that vacuum. So number one, the seven end time works of Satan. Number one, Satan is going to lead a false, unholy, Trinity. Now Satan has always tried to counterfeit or replicate uh, the things of God because he's not God and he's not even a God. Uh, sometimes when I listen to preaching and teaching it becomes apparent by verbiage and things that are spoken from the pulpit that people ascribe way too much power and authority to Satan and to the fallen angels. Satan is not a God. Satan is a defeated, fallen angel. Does he have power? Yes. Does he have authority? Yes. Is he impacting our world, our society, our education, our politics, and so on? Absolutely. But does he have any power over God? No. Does he have any power over Jesus Christ? No. Does he have any power 
over the Holy Spirit? No. Does he have any power over the victorious church of the Lord Jesus Christ? No. Does he have any authority over believers who are walking in right relationship with God and living under the covenant? Absolutely not. Satan has no power over the church and the children of God. But the ungodly? Absolutely. Just this week, uh, I received uh, a picture and a prayer request. Uh, a pastor uh, and a church that I've ministered at. Uh, apparently, uh, the occult or witches or somebody involved in Satanism came to their church and drew some type of satanic emblem in the parking lot, or I'm not exactly sure the location, and uh, they put down some type of what looked to be a satanic offering. Uh, there was a dead bird wrapped in some type of leaf, and uh, I saw several other things in the picture that was forwarded to me. And the question was asked of me, do you have any idea what this is? My response was, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what devil, what demon, what witch, what war warlock, what any power of the devil tries to bring against the church, it has no effect upon the blood-bought and the redeemed. I think of many years ago, R.W. Schambach, uh, there was a story he told when he was pastoring a lady in his church. Uh, there was a witch in town that hated this woman, and this Christian woman called, uh, at that time it was Pastor Schambach, and uh, she was distressed. And she said, this woman has come to my door and she has sprinkled some type of evil powder all over my doorstep and has drawn some type of satanic sign in it. And I can't get out of my house without stepping in it. Uh, Pastor, what should I do? And Pastor Schambach, if I remember the story, said, here's what I want you to do. Are you listening? She said, yes, I'm listening. He said, take your shoes off. She said, what? He said, take your shoes off. She said, all right, pastor, my shoes are off. What should I do now? He said, open your front door 